Welcome to this video cast and podcast simultaneous version of Wine, Women, and Writing, everyone. I'm Pamela Fagan Hutchins. I write funny romantic mysteries, and I also do this podcast, which is basically like my personal book club, but also it's a, it's a chance to primarily look at stories with strong, authentic, complex female characters at their core and the wonderful authors that write them and the real life experiences they're based on. So before we get started today, I did want to remind you that if you haven't read my book, Live Wire, then you probably, um, your life is over, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's just horrible that you haven't. I'm just kidding. But please go pick up a copy. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of contests still running out on my website, PamelaFaganHutchins.com. And not only that, but um, while you're there, you can catch up on back episodes of Wine, Women, and Writing and the special um, masculine, man, masculine Men and Mystery versions as well, if you're into male characterization. But speaking of great female characterization, a few years ago, I had the chance to um, meet this this um, promising author with this magnificent, really long manuscript um, at a <laughs> retreat at my house. And I just fell in love with her and I fell in love with the book. And of course, I'm talking about Mac Little over here on my left. Good morning. Hello, Mac. Good morning. Hi, Pamela. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. <laughs> well, it's it's super to have you. I feel like it's a long time coming because you and I did meet um, through the Houston writing community several years ago now. Yes, it's been a while. Um, yeah. So it, you were my first teacher, I think. Uh, I met you in a critique at first. Exactly. I how, cool, <laughs> how cool you were. <laughs> You were so deluded. <laughs> I thought you were cool. <laughs> but we did. We met through critiquing. And so I think my really my first extended, well, I've got to say this, Felicia experience, because I know you by another name than Mac Little. You want to you wanna tell us what that's all about? Well, sure. Um, my middle name is Mac. Uh, so I'm Felicia Mac Little. And um uh, I always thought my middle name was cool and kind of wanted to go buy it for a long time now. So this is my big opportunity. And, you know, I get to pay homage to my dad, who I love very much. I'm glad to be named after him. Oh, that's cool. I didn't realize it was your dad's name. Now, I'll admit I knew it was your middle name because you and I have had this conversation before, but I had no idea it was your daddy's name. Mm -hmm. That's super. Yeah. Do you, do you, um, do you find yourself still introducing yourself to Felicia as Felicia when you're supposed to be calling yourself Mac or is it just gelled? No, I did it uh, at the book signing actually. I went up to the bookstore and I said, hi, I'm Felicia. I'm here for, you know, to do the reading and they go, who, who is Felicia? <laughs> <laughs> it's like my superhero alter ego. <laughs> We have a Mac reading and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm Mac. Oh, and they're like, I thought you were a boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of cool because it does have that, um, it flows between gender expectations feel to it, which I think is, is useful for an author. Um, you know, you wrote a book that to me, and let me mention for you guys, if you haven't read Progeny yet, you need to go out and get a copy. It's a new release. So you, chances are you haven't had a chance yet. But it's, I, here's my attempt to describe it, Felicia Mack. It is a urban horror fantasy. Is, is that as good as anything? That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and it's really, it's an epic story, you know, that spans multiple generations and um, it's historical. It's one of the things I loved about it was that it really um, explores different religions without making that the point of the book. Uh, you know, all kinds of cool elements that we'll talk about. But what I wanted to start with was that I think the fact that, you know, you're going by uh, a name that is, gen you know, blind to gender really could be male or female is especially cool because you've got a book that at its core showcases diverse characters and this this doesn't pinhole you or, or pin you know stick you to a particular reader you want to tell us if that was intentional or or your feelings about it 
No, it was intentional because um, I I was kind of um, unsure about how a female author would be received in um, the fantasy horror genre. Uh, they may have certain expectations, and you know, not nothing against Twilight, but I don't want people confusing my book with something that's a lighter and YA. And I don't know. Unfortunately, a male name has more, I think, carries more weight with um, this particular genre and horror. It may, make a, it may make more male readers more likely to, to pick up the book. I think you're right. And, you know, it makes me think about men that write under women's name in romance and women's fiction, women that write under men's name, people that use initials to keep people from guessing their gender so that they don't... Um, fall victim to stereotypes about what you would get from a male or female author. And let me tell you, if you're a guy watching this and you're like, that gorgeous woman is not Mac. I just, you know, I thought Mac was a boy, like they were saying at Murder by the Book. This is not a, uh, this is not a chick book. This is, I mean, you know, this is sure ain't chick lit and it's not YA. I would, I, would you have, look, you have a teen, a daughter who used to be a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, would this have been, by your rating scale, something that she would have read as a teenager? So I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, I believe it would be because, um, well, as a teenager, her her reading was a, um, a little sophisticated. Uh, She's brilliant, <laughs> boy, folks. She's like super genius kid, and I wish that she were mine. Yeah, but um, it's it's really not for for teenagers. <laughs> it's not it's not YA. It's uh, it has you know graphic violence at some points and you know sexual situations and some graphic sexual situations. I mean, in in a really great way. And this book, when I first read this early draft, because Felicia um, came to a retreat at my house years ago, and it was a basically a finish that novel retreat. And so she sent the first 50 pages and I asked um, her some questions about, you know, who are your favorite writers? And, and you know, when you envision this book, what do you want it to be? And she sent the, these pages. And I think the first chapter you sent was a very a religious allegory, almost chapter about um, fallen angel, you know, kind of, kind of stuff. And it was almost lyrical. I mean, it was just, I was just like, oh, I was reading it and then the next chapter is like contemporary Paris and it's this asshole guy and, and you know sexually um not deviant but uh, dominating and you know etc the 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 character differentiation the scene and era differentiation and the differentiation in situations from the um, gritty to the graphic to the loving to the historical how did you keep it all straight <laughs> it's just amazing well um when i when i first got found my footing in writing the novel it was basically compartmentalization i wrote a scene at a time and so on that every scene i had a, a scene worksheet of what i wanted to um accomplish with regards to the plot and you know what I want to include in there. And so they're kind of like short stories basically. So I get into the story in one scene at a time. So it's easy for me to, I guess, it's easy for me to differentiate. And you took, I mean, this wasn't a book you wrote overnight either. No, it took me over 10 years to write it, you know, yeah. How long is it taking you now that you are working on the next books because this is a series signs of darkness did i get that right is it signs of signs of dark darkness yeah yes okay um and so it's a series so the first one took 10 years mm -hmm. number two uh number two took about two years and it's uh my publisher says i'm gonna have to cut it in half because it's twice as long as the, the first it one took one year two books <laughs> two years that's one year a book <laughs> yeah, there you go. And I have a ready-made trilogy. So <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yay. <laughs> I'm so excited about that. And and um and so it took you 10 years. You mm -hmm. had these individual scenes where you'd have to wash your brain clear of current day, of everything else you'd written before, and just immerse yourself in that one 
moment. Yeah, yeah. And something something that helps me immerse myself is listening to music. So when I was in um, 10 BCE, I was listening to uh, traditional Yemeni music where it's, it's uh, set in the kingdom of, of Sheba and Sheba was formerly Ye Yemen. So I immersed myself in, in that type of music. Um, when I was writing present day with my English characters because they have a, they have a different voice and a different way of saying things. So I, most writers don't do this, but I have television going on in the background. So I listen to the tutors and, you know, when I was writing Claudius, who's Cockney, I would listen to the Christopher Nolan movies in the background. And it gets me kind of in the rhythm of, of the speech and, and the character. I think that's a really cool idea. Um, I listen to music that's related to characters and eras and, and things like that as I'm writing as well. I don't listen to TV, but that's a good idea actually to have that. Ch it's like chatter. I, mean, I know some people that read, excuse me, write in coffee shops and keep their headphones off, which, you know, that's way too distracting for me because that's real stuff. But it does. It helps you pick up on that, the rhythm, the cadence, the sound, um, the diction, the dialogue, you know, that's a good idea. Now, with respect to um, putting together these different geographic settings, you did a lot of research via travel. Oh, yeah. I love to travel. And, and, and as I travel, I see things that give me ideas. Um, yeah, so some of the scenes in, in the book, like the opening scene with Chaz, I was there on the street and I found this little, it was actually a parking garage, but it was shaped like a chapel. And I just thought it was really fascinating. And I'm like, I got, I took pictures of it and, and the scene around it. I'm like, I got to write about this somehow. And I love that. it is a novel. So as when you were when you were there and you were exploring that area, were you thinking Chaz? Were you thinking of that scene or were you just thinking, I've got to catalog this. I'm, I'm going to use this. Uh, I wasn't thinking of anything. I, I, I just it was just something that was that I found inspiring. Yeah. I, I was like, I got to use this somewhere, you know. Um, oh, I, love it. I was writing the book, but I didn't know what I was going to do with Chaz at that point. I just knew that that chapter needed to be in there. Yeah. Um, I went to New Orleans and um, I knew one of my characters was going to be a voodoo priestess, but, you know, I didn't know much about it. So while we were in New Orleans, we visited a voodoo uh, shop and the proprietor invited me to go back into the temple. And it was amazing. All these books and knickknacks and, you know, uh, fetishes all crammed together in this like haphazard way and I put that in the book you know that that helped me write my book and a scholar in a in one of the new times um new york times books so that maybe <laughs> my book might be finished or do something good on the market <laughs> <laughs> that's a good idea. I, I, I think that would be so cool. I would be a little bit nervous in there. Like, I don't want to piss this person off. And after I leave, they like put a hex on me or something, but. Pretty... Well, you have to believe in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, I lived in the islands for 10 years. So there's part of me that does, you know, I, I had a house with a, a jumbie spirit or a ghost spirit in it. And I promise you I did. And so, you know, I going in as a Texas woman, I didn't believe but coming out on the other side of the experience yeah oh I'm a believer I believe in a lot of things that probably people would be surprised about um which you know again brings us back full circle to progeny there's a lot of things in there that are based upon what a lot of people would think of as myth or, mm -hmm. or um even religious texts which a lot of people believe, a lot of people don't. They, they don't always agree with each other, these religious texts, for instance. And it was, that, as I said, was my favorite part of the book was trying to um, think back to my religious studies and, and how they related. So tell us about that, that um, underpinning of right. curiosity in it. Yeah, so um, growing, growing up, um, I, I was Pentecostal 
I started out Pentecostal and that's, that's pretty hardcore. And, um, but as a child, it was fun for me. I love going to the services and, you know, uh, expressing myself spiritually and hearing the music and the tambourines and people, and then going to the, 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 um, the tabernacles that would happen every week. You go to the tent meetings. Yeah. And so I mean, was, this like, was this like a lot of, um, of weeping and, and, and singing or was it snakes or was it all of the above or charismatic and um, the, the preacher cast out demons. Demons were very, you know, prominent in their, you know, uh, lit- liturgies and, um, you know, they were responsible, responsible for everything that went wrong and, so as I was doing research for my book, and I realized that the demons that the Christians and the Hebrew, Hebrews name used to be gods in Samaria and people prayed to them and for them to do, you know, to help them out. And so uh, I found that really interesting. And um, interesting. You were destined to write this book. You were trained as a small child that this was the book of your future. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, and as I've grown and, and learned more things, I've questioned my belief, uh, the religions and all. And so this book was uh, a good way for me to explore the different religions, uh, where the beliefs come from and, you know, and how, how is it supposed to, um, you know, help, you know, help us understand the world or whatever. <laughs> well, and and let me make sure that listeners understand because I've talked about gritty scenes and graphic sexuality. And now we're talking about basically, um, you know, demons and religion and there's also vampires. So, I mean, this has this, the vampires element to me was a very logical leap, you know, with, from those demons and the things that, you know, are at the, you know, millennia ago and where it all started. But you mentioned not having people think this be a Stephanie Meyer book and not another Twilight. And that's why, because there are scions in this book or vampires. So tell us about the vampires. How'd that come about? Um, well, the vampires are, are um, a hybrid of gin and um, gin and human, not not through birth or it's, it's through, um, let's see. I have the origin story in the second book and it's basically, uh, we have the story of Lilith. She wanted to be human and she, um, you know, um, found this dying woman and, you know, uh, found a way to become human by uh, pouring her demon blood into the woman. So um, yeah. So there, <laughs> I know it's, it's <laughs> like, you can write one thing that a, a lot of readers expect is that a writer can talk about what they write. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's a leap that not many of us can make. I mean, you're the focus of the interview and you're like, so tell us the, the exact moment that you knew you were going to write Lilith and how, you know, it's like, oh, I just did. <laughs> the, point, the point is, is that humans have the sensuality that demons don't have. And uh, by, by um, it, um, taking over the human's bodies, they're able to, to have this passion and this emotion that they can express or feel as, as a demon, so. It's very cool in the books. And, mm-hmm. and it is, it's interesting to me because I kept finding myself wanting to go back to kind of like you're saying that origin story. Like when I would have those moments where I would like be thinking, I flipping back, it would be because I wanted to read one more time how it all started, you know, because that was the part that was the fantasy, the fantasy leap, right? It was the take this religion and this history and then twist it half a notch and this thing, you know, this blossoming out of it, this whole world blossoms out of it. Um, Because we're getting a little bit close to the end of time. I want to end of our time, not the end of time. That would be a totally different apocalyptic story, but uh, end of world story. What I wanted to talk to you a little bit about was that you really felt it was important to um, write a character 
that reflected the kind of character you would want to see in a story like this, that diversity was important to you. And I, th I think I was reading about this in your mission statement on your website, and I wanted you to be able to address that because I thought that it was really important. All uh, right. Um, well, growing up, I've, I've read all these books, these horror books, these adventure novels, but I was never, never able to see myself in them. I would have to kind of write myself in them or, or have daydreams. You know, so that I yeah. could, you know, feel like I'm a part of the, or, or that someone like me could have the adventure. And it wasn't until I read Maya Angelou where she traveled and did all these wonderful things that uh, I could, I could live outside the box that I felt like I was put in or, or inside the box that I was excluded from. Yeah. So um, that's what I want to do with my books. I want to uh, have little girls like me have a, a hero they can look up to, but also in my book, it's a representation of, you know, of my world. I have black people, I have white people, I have Middle Eastern, I have a whole array of people in my world. And I, I think I should reflect that in, in my novels. Um, one thing I don't understand is I, sometimes the, you have these novels and they imagine a future without black people. And, <laughs> and that's weird to me. And, and it's, like- It's don't... weird. It's like almost weird in a unspeakably horrible, you know, what are you saying here way? Why does one race go away altogether? So- Right, and, and I don't want to put the honest, and also I think black people or people of color have a responsibility to step up and and create this art and create this stuff and not rely on white authors to it, include us. But um, I think it's a logical step. I, I don't understand why, <laughs> why they don't take it. But you know, um, if we want to see it, we have to make it. And the, um, the original love interest of Zenobia Grant, who's the protagonist, if you will. There's a lot of point of view characters in this book, but this is a book about Zenobia and her quest for identity and, you know, self-actualization and all that stuff. And her original love interest is diverse from her. So she's a black woman and he's a, I, he seems white to me. I don't remember for yeah. sure, but he's diverse from her. I know that. Rich. Yeah. White, rich, elitist. You know, he looks down on Zen in the beginning before he knows her. And, um, and they, both had, they both had judgments about each other uh, when they saw each other across the room. But once they got closer and got to know each other, they realized, you know, there's more to each other than they could have ever known. It's uh, pretty reflective of most of our relationships, right? Uh... Exactly. Exactly. Um, it was one of the things that I felt made this book really authentic, you know, and I started this out by saying I, I like to talk about the authenticity of characters. You can certainly hear from Felicia Mack that, um, that, that she's had a lot of experiences to draw from to create this depth for her characters. So before I let her go, I want her to tell her, tell us about one more thing. I mean, right now you see her beside me and she looks like a superhero goddess with her gorgeous blue hair. <laughs> I'm so jealous of your hair. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, and, and she looks like a writer. She looks like a movie star. She looks like all these things. But once upon a time, you were a soldier. Yes, I was in the army. Um, after I graduated college with an English degree, I wanted to be a writer then. <laughs> you can't do anything with an English degree. No, you really can't. And I couldn't afford to go to graduate school. So um, I joined the army and uh, it was so much fun for me because I was kind of like Private Benjamin in the army because everything was like, this is like, the movies and we were in basic <laughs> training. Um, we would have cadences that we marched to and the cadences reflected what we were feeling. It was like being in a musical. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and the drill sergeant got angry with me and got in my face and started screaming. I was like, oh, this is cool. It's happening to me now. <laughs> 
I just had a blast. I like camping. And <laughs> <laughs> this is, you are so funny. And the thing is, is that she's being funny, but she's also being completely honest and real, which makes it even more funny. I can picture you that someday will you write that book? <laughs> I want to read that book too. <laughs> it may not be as much fun to write, but my gosh, that's funny. You really could picture that as a movie and it's hysterical. I, Private Benjamin was one of my favorites of all time. So anyway, <laughs> well, you guys, I could talk to Felicia forever. We have, as I said, a history between us. I have a history with her book. I feel a, a very strong connection to it. And I really hope you'll take the chance on it and go out and pick up a copy and dive in with her into what is at least a three book um, arc in this series. So before, um, before we actually go, I'm going to try something new today. This is like, this is like totally avant-garde for me. I'm going to try to play my outro music as we do the outro and I'm actually terrified. So um, <laughs> this is, this is live, um, uh, live podcast, live uh, video cast. Woo, that's so exciting. Okay. So thanks for being on with us, you guys. Thanks for being a part of Wine, Women and Writing. Be sure to remember that next week we've got J.B. Jameson and that his book, Distraction, is what we'll be talking about. Pick up a copy of my live wire as well. And until then, here's to great books by great authors and great writing. I hope you experience a little of everything in the next week. You guys take care. Thank <laughs> you.